online induction and orientation program conducted by Teaching Learning Center, Ramanujan College. The topic for the day is Roles and Responsibilities of a Teacher in the Institutes of Higher Education. I'm Dr. Shruti Jain and hope all of you are good. To be honest, meeting like this today on this platform makes me sure that we are not living anything less than history. A couple of years back, who could have ever imagined that we would be meeting on this platform to discuss the transformed roles and responsibilities of ours, as in we teachers. So, be it because of the unforeseen or challenging circumstances created by pandemic COVID-19, or because of the massive revolutions in information or technology, or because of the world going truly global, we cannot deny the fact that the educational environment is transcending its boundaries of conference halls and classrooms and extending itself into our homes and world around us. There is a shift from standardized learning to a lifelong learning, which will help students in both academic success as well as in making world a better place. This shift has also prompted us teachers to view the different facets of our job that range from relationship to students and colleagues, curriculum, syllabus, learning outcomes, methodologies, pedagogies, channels of discussions, tools and techniques. In short, we need to reconsider and restructure the art and science of learning vis-a-vis -vis our roles and responsibilities in this ever-changing and fast-evolving postmodern world. So with today's session, let us try to rethink and redesign these roles and responsibilities of ours and empower the teaching learning process with new ideas, meanings and tools. Today's discussion is divided into four sessions. In this session, we will be discussing the academic roles and responsibilities of a teacher. But before we start discussing them, let us take a look at the different classroom structures that have been a part of our history and also trace the gradual transformation of the institutions of higher education. If we begin talking about the modern-day Indian institutes of higher education, then they have their roots in the British colonial rule. Around 1780s, the East India Company had set up the first institution of higher education in Calcutta. So let us go to the medieval universities of Britain itself. They were something like this. Along with this picture, if I refer to the Indian Vedic education, religious lectures, or preachings of Kautilya's Arthshastra, we can say that there were only few books and students and the seat of the teacher along with these few books were the only source of information and education. With the advent of printing press in 15th century, there was an increase in the number of books and consequently the students. The libraries were also helping people gain access to information. One could go to libraries and read. However, the accessibility was not easy for everyone, be it in terms of time or reachability. Also, each and every library could not have all the published and printed books. In India, the first of higher education institutes was set up by the Britishers where missionaries were making the students cram up the British cultural values. From 1935, Indianization of education started and by 1960s and 70s, as countries were coming out of the clutches of colonial power, expansion of universities began worldwide. For years after that, teaching was majorly a mixture of information dispensing and spotting and preparing academically inclined students for the suitable jobs waiting out for them in the socio-commercial world. Teachers taught of fixed labors through standardized lessons year after year, and students sitting on the desk dutifully recorded what they heard. But today, in the ever-evolving world where technology is influencing and changing every aspect of our society, where there is an intricate relationship between the local and the global, 
and when unforeseen and unprecedented circumstances like COVID-19 have been impacting the humankind, the academic community will have to shift from the teaching culture to a learning culture, which can empower students to be the catalyst of change that they want to live and celebrate the unique human ability to endow life and world with beauty and meanings against all odds. The good is that the education system has somewhere already started working towards these changes. For instance, through the innovative application of technology via this induction program, we have turned the current challenge of disruption and discontinuity posed by COVID-19 to our advantage by engaging with fraternity in meaningful and productive discussions. Another example is the way academic community adopted the distinctive need for e-learning and continued the teaching learning process over remote and digital platforms this year. Even when there are no regular classrooms and examinations, evaluation patterns have changed, we are all sailing through it bravely, and I am hopeful this year will not be remembered as the year of loss in education system, but as the year where significant changes happened in the teaching learning process. However, we still need to redefine many other components of education system to be empowered for restructuring the learning process that can lead to holistic learning outcomes for our students, ensuring both their academic success and overall well-being. For instance, the understanding of time has to transcend its conventional measurement of minutes and hours. In context to the modern-day teaching learning process, time cannot be any more measured in terms of hours and days spent in covering a particular part of the syllabus, or in terms of bell ringing at the start and end of a class. Rather, it has to be defined in terms of those episodes and moments of experiences where a student undergoes a transition or change meant for the betterment of his or her own self and society. In other words, time now has to be understood in terms of a symbolic journey through which a student tries to self-reflect and discover his or her own interest or inner calling. This journey or process of evolvement where a student gradually discovers and understands his or her own individual self and interest and their relation to the wider world is in fact the beginning of real education. And teacher's new role is to be a catalyst to this journey. That is, the role of a teacher has to be transformed into a facilitator who can help students to integrate their emotional needs, social requirements and intellectual growth. You must be then wondering, what about the pre-decided curriculum and those conventional chains of finishing up slavers by the semester or year-end and standardized test? Exactly. This is what the teaching learning process has to move from. This is a move from routinized chain of events comprising of four-wall classrooms, dictating lessons, periodical three-hour examinations, and five-hour schedule. A move from the importance of teaching to the importance of student-centric learning. As teachers, we have always known the fact that knowledge is ever-growing. No one mantra is universal for attaining success, and in the contemporary times, even information is readily available in bits and bytes, making the students feel empowered more than ever. So can our role be really confined to a 60 minutes lecture, or dispensing the frame slavers, or doing evaluation based on curriculum? A big no. A teacher will have to play the role of a facilitator who can expand upon students' potential and co-create knowledge with them. We will have to make our students observe the difference between information seeking and learning. We will have to help our students see the difference between becoming the masters of the discipline and experiencing a love for never-ending and ever-evolving process of learning. Meaningful educational experiences are those that help students to deal with the issues of the real world, and thus these experiences should be rooted in the outside world itself. However, as the outside world is fast changing, no fixed ways, 
mediums, instructions, and cramming can alone keep students equipped with survival skills needed both at personal and professional level. So, the new role of a teacher is to make students learn and participate in the creation and extension of new horizons of knowledge. To understand it further, let's do an exercise. Have a look at the coming picture and try to remember it. Now, try to recall all the things that were there in the picture. So, for example, how many bundles of currency were there? What all denominations were there? Which colors were used for writing? How many rubber bands were there? Which denomination was the man counting? What was the color of the sponge? What was the color of the paper on which text and numbers were written? How many bundles of each denominations were there? So how many of you could answer all the questions or how many of the questions could you answer? Let us see. But wait, the earlier picture or reality has partially lost its relevance as the Indian society underwent a drastic change because of demonetization. We had been living in a primarily cash economy and demonetization all of a sudden took away the major chunk of the cash from the market. Rather, because of demonetization, cash lost its supremacy to e-wallets like Paytm, Google Pay, ICICI, Pockets and many more of such sorts. When we try to teach and make students remember standardized slavers, we sometimes tend to forget that things become meaningful only when a student learns by connections and relations to everyday rea changing reality and the wider world. Teachers need to be reflective facilitators and stir students to comprehend that learning must be contextualized in these changes, needs and challenges of the real world and undergoing this process of learning leads to knowledge acquisition. Now, how can we initiate this process of learning? On the basis of the discussion of various concepts and perspectives that a topic can be looked from, let the students critically reflect on the curriculum content or any topic from the syllabus. In this process, they might accept or even reject some stated facts, but in the process, they will also reflect at the different workings of the real world. This will also help them develop different ways to look at an issue. They will also probe into the reasons for the existence of the issue and will come up with various solutions or uses. This process in itself is also a knowledge acquiring process. Hence, leave your students with some content that can be an idea, topic in their curriculum, a video, a picture, an issue, an activity or an exercise. Devise a flipped classroom model. Aim them, aim to make them active participants. Plan activities that make students feel included and not just let them be passive observants. Let them recognize the significance of the topic in their life and surroundings so that the knowledge gained can lead to a larger good for the students and the society. Let us discuss it further through an example. We all will agree that a stark gender divide exists in our society. Through different stages in our life, we have learned that one is born a biological male or female but becomes a man or a woman through an elaborate system of cultural learning. 
My friend's three-year-old child, even when is not taught, can yet recognize and says that Papa goes to work and cooking is done by Mama. Notions of masculinity and femininity are so subtly integrated in our nurturing that we don't even realize that how well we are developed according to the expected patriarchal patterns. Socialization of roles begin at a very early age. Girls are gifted pink and are expected to play with dolls and boys are given blue and mechanical toys. Nonetheless, even if you call it a traditionalist view, the modern view of women's world has also not changed much as a working woman is in a double bind. She has to function equally well as a wife and a mother and as a professional career woman also. And if she fails, she is subjected to criticism and guilt for failure in her domestic duties. Her professional commitment and capabilities are immediately put under the scanner. So what is the solution? Let the students find it. But first, let them recognize and realize the limitations, drawbacks and wrongs of the different gender-specific social behaviors and roles through a movie, short story or an advertisement. मेरी छोटी सी गुड़िया कितनी बड़ी हो गई घर घर खेलती थी अब घर संभालती है ऑफिस संभालती है आई एम सो प्राउ And I'm so sorry. Sorry कि ये सब तुम्हें अकेले करना पड़ता है सॉरी कि जब तुम घर घर खेलती थी तो मैंने तुम्हें रोका नहीं ये नहीं कहा कि ये सिर्फ तुम्हारा काम नहीं है तुम्हारे हस्बैंड का भी है पर कहता भी कैसे है मैंने भी तो कभी तुम्हारी मम्मी की हेल्प नहीं की और तुमने जो देखा वो ही सीखा तुम्हारे हस्बैंड ने भी बचपन में यही देखा होगा घर घर खेलते वक्त वो टीवी देखने की या न्यूज़पेपर पढ़ने की एक्टिंग करता होगा और तुम जैसी कोई छोटी सी लड़की चाय बनाने की एक्टिंग करती होगी उसके डैड की तरफ से सॉरी तुम्हारे डैड की तरफ से सॉरी और हर उस डैड की तरफ से सॉरी जिसने कई कई सालों से गलत एग्जाम्पल सेट किया सॉरी के साथ मैं अपनी तरफ से छोटी सी कोशिश करूंगा कि घर के काम में मम्मी की हेल्प करें किचन का किंग ना बन पाऊं तो कम से कम लॉन्ड्री में तो हाथ बटाऊं इतने साल एक गलत एग्जाम्पल सेट किया है अब कुछ सही कर जाऊं तुम्हारा पापा Seeing the woman in double bind of home along with the child and job the students like the father in the advertisement will also find a way to break the gender divide and fix roles attached to different genders it is easier to make students understand the content if we engage them with the real world situations now next as learning is a process that is dependent on lot of factors like constantly changing socio cultural environmental political and economic realities let let your students also realize that knowledge also keeps evolving with changing realities students need to gradually understand that knowledge is not a fixed thing but a chain of creative thoughtful pragmatic and reflective learnings which settle down like a value addition in the mind of the learner in order to be called knowledge it has to have the power to transform individual to adapt and reconstruct better living and working conditions for example humans have always been influenced 
intensely by nature cycles, including phases of moon, cycles of seasons, and other circadian rhythms. However, in the modern globalized world, we lost touch with nature, especially in urban spaces. With the coming of multinational world, our joint family system shifted to nuclear family. We moved from houses to, with courtyards having tulsi, people and neem trees into small apartment buildings where even a flower remained invis invisible. Our contact with nature became obsolete. Not seeing a flower, a tree or a river or a pond beeped like a false alarm to our psyche. It somewhere fed our ego with more authority. We felt we were the only powerful creatures in the existence. This led to the adding up of negative aspects in our being like more anger, more stress, more violence, less humility and a big ego. We forgot that nature nourished our being. Life is about joy of sharing with other humans the wonder of existence that is unfolding around us through nature and knowledge is to create and experience a sense of wonder to the miracle this creation is. Today, with COVID-19 hitting the life hard, we gradually learned the importance and necessity of a connection and a right bond with nature, co-beings and with our own deeper selves. This new value addition of the importance of nature and bonds is helping us to strike a new work-life balance and relationship equations with our colleagues and students. Learning in relation to the world we live in not only contributes to academic development but also enhances social-emotional development, that is, emotions like empathy, reality like diversity and skills like relationship building also get strengthened. Therefore, rather than imparting something to the students that is already laid, facilitate the spark to learn unlearn and relearn. Let them co-create knowledge. Once this happens, they will have an eternal commitment to the learning process. A simple exercise as an example. Form a group of five. Let them brainstorm on the importance of protecting trees on the basis of the story or movie that the students have already seen and then ask the students to collaborate and write a paragraph on the need or responsibility to save trees and thus consequently protect and conserve the environment. Also ask the students to present it in the class. The learning outcomes will be Students will learn to look into the future. Imagining the possible. Collaborative learning. Learning to summarize. Sensitivity to environmental issues will be generated, that is the need of the hour. Adherence to a timeline, making presentations and finally they will learn to conceptualize a project with some objectives. In this process of brainstorming with content, the students will come up with questions and bang on. This is another successful shift that you will achieve. Making them think, express and speak their understanding discover their individuality, improvise with limited resources, acknowledge the different opinions of classmates. So, flip your classroom. Flipped classroom is actually flipping the traditional classroom methods. Unlike the traditional classroom, in the flipped classroom, the content to be discussed in a class is already given to the students. They go through it before coming to the class and then the teacher utilizes the class time in such a way that students are guided to apply their acquired knowledge for deeper understanding of the content and display their ability to use it. This keeps the student learning at the center as they become the active constructors of knowledge and they also get the space to put the acquired knowledge into practice. This also helps varied learners to come and build knowledge together and understand the gaps in their understanding. Let us assume that we have to discuss and explain the significance of paralanguage in communication. The teacher can first ask the students to read or watch a video on the components of paralanguage and then he or she can begin with his or her class with an exercise where a geometrical figure 
like this has to be conveyed to the class by two students. One who can see the class and assist the fellow students in drawing the figure right by putting various para language components in use and the other who can neither see nor answer the queries of the fellow students in drawing the figure. The exercise will help draw students' attention to the importance of each and every element of para language and will also introduce them to the concept of feedback. Next role of teacher is to assist students to adjust to the present-day requirements of interdisciplinary approach and multidimensionality. I hope all of you must have read this beautiful short story titled Kabuliwala, published in 1892, written by the great Rabindranath Tagore. The story is about the bond of unconditional love which is beyond the realm of history. Kabuliwala, an Afghani Pathan, has come to Calcutta to sell almonds far from far away mountains and valleys. Separated from a little daughter, he finds happiness playing and narrating stories to five years old Mini, whose father buys almonds from the Kabuliwala. While teaching the story of universality of human responses and desires that touches an emo emotional chord, me and my students could not escape thinking and discussing the following. Barriers of suspicion that exist in 21st century society based on differences of religion. Second, the changed political relationship between many geographical masses. How are map constructed and altered? Terrorism and its impact. Emergence of a third country in between India and Afghanistan. Mobility. The free travelling from Afghanistan to Calcutta to a now restricted one. Question like migration and internal movements came in. Commerce and trade be between Afghanistan and India. Commodities that were marketed by Afghans in India especially nuts and dried fruits, and role of Kabuliwalas in the Indian economy. No discipline can be discussed in seclusion as it doesn't operate in isolation in the working markets. We need to interact about, a, about how a particular discipline has connections to the wider world so that students can communicate and collaborate across boundaries and cultures. In the global world, the learning approach has to be interdisciplinary and multidimensional. Now, let us discuss two very important responsibilities of teachers, assessment and evaluation. Assessment and evaluation are the two tools that can help teachers to know if effective learning is taking place. Are the students meeting the learning objectives? Are the concepts clear to the students? But before we converse about the various methods, let us discuss what is assessment. Assessment is a gradual process that supports learning. It involves keeping a track or monitoring the progress of the students both at the individual and class level. By monitoring the progress, teachers can identify and plan the next or change steps and strategies in the process of learning. I use the word change because at times, certain methodologies can be ineffective. The assessment of the progress has to be in terms of the degree of understanding of the content and its relevance, knowledge gained and skills acquired. Standardized tests can be a part of assessment, but if we agree to the importance of learning material being dynamic, if learning outcomes have to be knowledge acquiring and skill based, if pedagogy should be collaborative and participative in nature, then assessment cannot be just in the form of static standardized tests. Teachers can experiment with new assessment reforms like real life research projects, presentation based on on field research, case studies, objective or multiple choice questions or one minute papers. The first three will also help to build the researcher skills of the students. Students will learn to invent creative ways to problem solving. will also know how to work in collaboration along with strengthening of the critical thinking and analytical reasoning. 
Next comes how to evaluate. Usually, we choose to evaluate through a common scale on which we mark students in form of numbers or grades symbolizing their performance from satisfactory to excellent. Doing so, we sometimes choose to evaluate a student in terms of comparison with the classmates or sometimes on the basis of students' linear progress. Nonetheless, evaluation need not be always periodic. Teachers can evaluate students in terms of day-to-day -day learning, that is, on the basis of what they write, speak and present during activities, presentations and discussions. As teachers, you can also keep the record of learning experience through technology, that is, in the form of a photo or even better, an audio or audio-video clip. The time-to-time -time assessment and evaluation will help both students and the teacher to take the required steps to augment the learning process. In the end of this session, I will say, help your students to see varied perspectives. Jerk them from the mold of a single truth. Let them understand the workings of the world around them. The new indispensable role of a teacher is of a catalyst, a facilitator. By, do by doing so, you will be helping your students find their own thoughts and voice which will make them stronger and confident to thrive and survive.